eight lessons on working with external recruiters. Most people have a love and hate relationship with technical recruiters. I have to admit that up until a few years ago, my feelings weren't that dissimilar. Then I had the opportunity to help a friend that was running his personal recruitment agency here in Sydney, Australia, and needed support building some tools for data manipulation. This engagement gave me first-hand experience on the day-to-day -day operations of the agency, specifically the behavior of clients and candidates. It was eye-opening. It shone a light to a lot of inexplicable situations that I had faced in the past as a hiring manager or a potential candidate. I gained an understanding of the reasons behind the choices in terms of staffing, remuneration and costs that most recruitment agencies face, and how sometimes they are forced into unethical choices just to stay afloat. Probably the most valuable lesson for me was that most companies don't engage with technical recruitment agencies the right way. I get asked very often to provide advice on this topic, so I decided to put together a list of the top eight recommendations when dealing with external recruiters. Number one, recruiters are lead generators. It might be fun to a lot of people, but down to its core, recruitment is a sales activity with funnels, pipelines and conversion ratios. Nothing more, nothing less. Specifically, external agencies work at the beginning of a hiring funnel as lead generators. Once you understand this aspect, it's immediately clear that two major factors influence the success of an agency. Number one, the size and quality of their network database, which needs to be kept continuously nurtured and up to date as people change jobs and move into state. Number two, their targeting capabilities. Can they listen and really understand the requirements for a role? Given a brief, can they identify a suitable candidate? As a hiring manager, you have no way of assessing the size and quality of an agency database, except for the results that you're getting. But you can and should, however, assess the agency based on targeting capabilities of its consultants. Specifically, how much you feel you're being heard and understood while working with them. Which brings us to number two. Reputation is everything. With recruitment agencies, like many pure service businesses with a very low barrier to entry, reputation is everything. Everybody can start a recruitment agency, provided that a suitable database of candidates is available. And believe me, they can be nowadays bought for a few thousand dollars. Given that most companies' hiring processes are broken and fraught with inefficiencies, and the global demand for software engineers hasn't abated, not even during a pandemic, it's no wonder that shady behaviors are common. They simply seem to pay off. The recommendation here is obviously not to engage with agencies with a bad reputation. I know a few even if they are cheap and entice you with good candidate profiles. Here are some examples of shady behaviors that should raise alarm bells. Number one, sending candidates profiles with T's and C's attached without a properly defined business relationship in place. Expecting that you honor the T's and C's you never sign on the first instance, especially around candidate ownership. Number two, insistence in getting admitted to an already crowded panel of agencies. More on this later. Number three, excessive staff churn, or employing very young consultants without prior experience or meaningful qualifications. If you don't know which agency to engage with, just ask around among colleagues and ex-managers and start from there. Number three, use them for hard to fill roles. This is the single most important misconception about recruiters, as their fees are expensive. You shouldn't use them for all of your roles, even if you have a budget. Specifically, junior positions should be filled internally using passive tools like job boards or referrals. Engaging on an agency for every role sounds like an easy approach when you are short of time, but it cannot last for long. After a couple of placements, the business, i.e. your boss or the CFO, will become less and less happy about paying the invoices, even if the expenses had been previously authorized. There must be something with seeing the big numbers on a PDF, I don't know. But sooner or later, someone in the business will raise objections to the cost of using external recruiters if the bills pile up. I recommend instead to use them only for senior or hard to fill roles from a tech lead, principal engineer onwards, and when referrals fail first. Even with volume hiring, i.e. more than 10 hires a year, you should never engage with an agency for more than 10 or 20% of roles, unless special contractual agreements, for example, cheaper costs for placement, are in place. On the other hand, significant referral fees, think about more than 4 k per placement, can yield great results at the low cost when doing volume hiring. As long as your work environment is one where people are so happy to come to work that they would want to invite their friends to join. Number four, number four, don't negotiate the fees down. Work on the contract. This may sound counterintuitive, but it's so important. 
people feel good about getting good deals and like to brag about how much lower they manage to negotiate the fees down the moment they walk out the meeting with a new recruitment agency. What they fail to understand is that getting a discount on a good or service that doesn't exist yet, in this case a candidate, will bring you an inferior product or no product at all. Most agencies struggle with prospecting and are continuously looking for new clients. After all, it's a very competitive business. To get new clients, they're happy to lower their fees more often than not. They then work in campaigns where they effectively reach out, i.e. spam, potential candidates on their database that match certain criteria, looking for people ready to change jobs. This works quite well when an agency is working multiple similar roles in terms of tech stack and seniority at the same time as it's quite efficient, one campaign can yield to multiple placements. From this perspective, it makes a lot of sense for the agency to present great candidates to the clients that are happy to pay more, not the ones that have negotiated lower fees. Therefore, unless you have a different leverage with the agency, long-term relationships, steady need for candidates, it makes much more sense not to negotiate the fees down. Current market conditions in Sydney, Australia, have an average fee for a full-time employee placement at around 15% of the annual salary inclusive of superannuation, which is a pension contribution here in Australia. Most boutique and high-end agencies work instead on the 18-22% to bracket, whereas anything under 15% will get your under-par results or the lowest priority with good candidates, which is the proverbial scraping of a barrel. Where you live, the numbers may be different, but you can ask around and do the math, the same principle will apply. Considering that I don't recommend volume hiring through external agencies, but only focusing on a few key roles, it makes sense to only work with high-end agencies, as the additional cost is simply justified with better, faster results, and it won't impact the bottom line of a business significantly. In terms of contract negotiations, there are areas where you should focus instead, specifically around replacement refund clauses. Contracts are primarily signed to handle problematic situations when things don't work out and this is no exception. Most agencies offer replacement credits for candidates who are let go or leave spontaneously too early in their tenure. This can happen for a myriad of reasons, including people moving countries, changing career or simply not liking the job and you should definitely have a close on the contract on this point. My recommendation is to propose a full refund within the first three months, then half refund up to six months, but no refund after 12 months. This will give you the opportunity to get your money back in case of a bad hiring decision within the first three months, like it never happened. Some agencies, though, tend to be inflexible on this point, which is also a respectable position as it affects their cash flow. But keep in mind that having no refund options will put you in a position to hire only when you are 100% convinced, which usually means slower hiring. It's a risk-benefit trade-off that you can choose and discuss if you know who you're working with. Well-established agencies are, will naturally not offer a refund, but a credit replacement option for up to the first six months of tenure. 5. Request results within four weeks. With the exception of holiday periods, Christmas, Easter, Chinese New Year, when people are not thinking about changing jobs or finding candidates is objectively harder, your expectation should be relatively simple. Three or four good potential candidates per position within four weeks. Any variation from this pattern is usually a bad sign. Too many candidates usually indicate an unclear understanding of what you're looking for and put the effort on you to sift through too many unmatching profiles. Too few candidates instead mean that either the agency you engage with does not have a big enough database for the niche you're looking into or the job description or the position isn't appealing enough. All in all, setting clear expectations together around timing for delivery at the beginning of the engagement is a key to manage the relationship successfully and make amendments if things aren't working. Number six, suggest exclusivity. This is a lesser known requirement but has important implications. Most employers keep a panel of agencies with which they had signed terms and conditions over the years. Usually the size of this panel grows with time as previous contracts stay in place until they are revoked, which is usually never. It's then a common mistake to give new roles to all the agencies on the panel at the same time. This is seen as a good idea because intuitively, casting a wider net should get you more candidates faster and accelerate the hiring process. Unfortunately, this is rarely the case. There is only a finite number of matching profiles within an area you are recruiting in, and most agency databases will have an element of overlap. Having multiple agencies reach out to the same candidates for the same role independently creates significant issues. 
from different agencies fighting over candidate ownership to a perception of desperation when the same candidate is pinged about the same role multiple times by multiple subjects. Also, making the roles very public attract other agencies, which will then try and send you unsolicited CVs of potential candidates. To avoid these problems, just select the best agency to fill a role and suggest or offer temporary exclusivity. Your aim is to make the agency's work easier while still keeping up the time pressure and retaining an element of secrecy and exclusivity about the role itself. You should offer exclusivity only to a trusted agency with a good track of record and only for maximum three to four weeks. These terms should be openly discussed with the agency itself, as the job market conditions vary over time, and, but all in all, if done properly, exclusivity will bring you good results in less time. Number seven, give clear indication of what you're after. Many agencies don't ask for this too explicitly as they are too afraid to annoy the hiring managers with too many questions, but it's your responsibility to always provide a detailed description around the role, the technology, the company and its culture, and have the agency use this material while reaching out to potential candidates. Employer branding collateral works as a powerful magnet by bringing more motivated and interesting candidates through the funnel. Most hiring managers tend to think that producing this content is just too hard and or they simply don't have the time. In most cases instead, the material has already been produced or can be created in no time. All you need is a clear job and short job description that talks about the company, its journey, the role and where it fits, its expectations and requirements to be successful. A few links to blog posts, LinkedIn articles or YouTube presentations given by relevant members of the team of the organization or internally produced HR videos if available. After all, internal employer branding material is significantly easier to produce than it used to. And nowadays, most companies already have something. All you need to do is ask around. Number eight, don't go internal, then external. This is quite a common mistake when you have internal recruiters and the business underestimates the difficulty to find candidates in a very saturated market, like the one for software engineers. Advertising a role internally and then resorting to external agencies when the role remains unfilled for a long time has a big drawback. There is a high chance that the job ad has already been seen by most of the good potential candidates and has therefore lost freshness and a novelty effect. If a role stays unfilled for a long time, potential candidates can start wondering why. Has the employer unrealistic expectations on who to hire? Does the company have any internal issues that prevent them from filling the role? Do they know what they're looking for? So you should always decide upfront whether to fill a role internally or externally and stick to the chosen plan whenever possible. If you can't fill a role internally and decide to go external, uh, a good agency may ask you to rework the role and or change the title or the remuneration before reaching out to their network, which is a sensible recommendation as it shows that the company has learned from their mistakes and adapted the changing job market conditions. Just to recap, Recruitment agencies are expensive lead generators, so choose them according to their reputation, only for hard to fill roles. Set time boundaries and exclusivity when possible, while providing enough information so you can make your role more attractive and thus get outcomes faster. These rules are designed to maximize your chances of getting good candidates through the door without too much effort and in a timely manner.